A very good morning to all of you um, in this uh, Ulysses Compass Conference on Research and Innovation Internationalization Strategies for European University Alliances. It's a great pleasure having you here, and it's a, it is a privilege um, not only to represent Ulysses and, 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 and Compass in this conference, but to um, embark a journey um, the significant journey towards international cooperation in science and higher education. Uh, you know, we, we gather today in order to, to express um, the EU global approach to research and innovation, which means that um, the mobilization of the world's researchers and innovators is one of the, the crucial challenges for all of us, for the well-being of our citizens and future generations. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, global cooperation and, and going beyond Europe will be one of the cornerstones, not only of Europeans, uh, the European Union's research and innovation agenda, but also of European university alliances. So for today, um, we want to let you know that uh, we have split this day in, in two parts. The morning session uh, is about reaching beyond Europe, building collaborations outside um, the EU. And we are setting the stage for this discussion on how to foster strategic partnerships as European universities alliances. Um, I'm very grateful and, and privileged to welcome a distinguished group of speakers this morning. Um, the welcome and opening um, will be uh, by, done by Andreas Altmann, our rector here at MCI, representing MCI and uh, Ulysses. And we will then continue um, with the former um, EU Commissioner Franz Fischler, Franz uh, Fischler, um, who is also a member of the International Advisory Board of Ulysses and um, followed by the former Minister of Higher Education, Madame Frédéric uh, Vidal from France, who has been um, uh, strongly involved in the establishment of European University Alliances and its concept. So um, after uh, these three inputs by our rector, by Franz Fischler and by Madame Vidal, we will um, continue with a panel discussion and uh, followed by a um, by some time and uh, where, where we invite you to post your, your questions. So please prepare already now to come in um, and to address your questions on, uh, on, on our discussion regarding the strategic approaches um, for global collaboration from the perspective of European universities, but also from the perspective of Europe as a whole. Andreas, may I hand over to you for your welcome address? Yeah, many thanks to you, Siegfried. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear researchers, innovators, uh, guests and, uh, and uh, managers, um, faculty, alumni, whoever is interested in the common European uh, research and innovation interests. I'm very, very pleased to welcome you today as the host of this conference, which is uh, forms part of the COMPASS uh, program, COMPASS initiative within Horizon. And uh, we focus on ba basically on two things. The one thing is how can we at the beginning, and that is a uh, part of, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, European uh, University Ulysses, but it is also part of Horizon and Compass and the European idea. How can we work better together within Europe? And we all know, we all are aware that there is one key on future prosperity, on future well-being, and future cohesion, and that is research and innovation. How else could we encounter uh, new ideas? How else could we challenge and tackle the pro problems which are around, be it energy, be it uh, social cohesion, be it uh, technology, be it artificial intelligence, whatever. And we all know that each single institution, academic institution within Europe, is basically too small. 
And each uh, researcher is ba basically would be left alone if we all tried to tackle that uh, in a singular approach. And that means that uh, collaboration, especially in the field of, uh, uh, of research innovation, is so important. And that is more or less the idea of Ulysses and all the other universities uh, within the European University Alliance concept. But now talking about beyond Europe. And that is more or less the headline of uh, and and the, the concept, uh, the mission of this uh, little conference. Actually, Europe is the continent of uh, of dreams for so many people out there in in the global environment, and we all very often within Europe question the role and the importance and the value of Europe, but looking from outside of Europe to Europe, we all know that Europe is very, very attractive and is a, a dream for many. But how could we embed them, first of all, and how could we connect them uh, in the field of research innovation, and how could we actively reach out to them and get the best researchers and innovators and partners to work together with us? And that is basically the, the concept of this little conference and of going beyond Europe. And for that, I want to leave now space for my other speakers, but uh, we have been already, as Ulysses, we have been reaching out to a very, very nice university in Vietnam, uh, in Da Nang, and we'll sign the collaboration agreement, uh, the, uh, the uh, association agreement uh, in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And there's already another university in Canada, but I now do not want to tell more. Many, many thanks for being part with us and happy to answer your question, uh, question whenever they come in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for, for uh, welcoming and opening this conference, uh, this Ulysses conference. And uh, just for those of you who haven't been in, in, involved in uh, Ulysses uh, up to now, Ulysses is an alliance formed by eight universities. Uh, we are um, a, a group that has grown over the last three years, and we are now assembling um, eight different countries in Europe, in, in, in one of the, the, the candidate countries, which are the University of Seville in Spain, the University of Côte d'Azur in France, the University of Genoa in Italy, the University of Münster in, in, uh, in, in, in Germany, the University of the Technical University of Košice uh, in Slovakia, Haga Helia University of Applied Sciences in Helsinki, uh, the University of Montenegro, and last but not least, MCI, the Entrepreneurial School. So we, we spread across Europe, and we represent um, very different parts of Europe when it comes to these joint strategies in research and higher education. But before we go into the role of European universities, I think it's important to, to see the, the, the big lines in, in, in very European uh, where, where European politics or where Europe as a whole is heading to or where it should go, uh, what kind of directions we would wish for Europe and who could tell us better than Franz Fischler. Franz Fischler, as a, Dr. Franz Fischler, as a former uh, commissioner for agriculture, I, I think at that time... Um, uh, you have been responsible for half of the budget uh, of the European Union, if I remember that correctly. Uh, and you had to manage quite difficult challenges and, and, and crises at that time. When I think about the, 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 the cow disease crisis, uh, when you were in, in, in charge and, and, and other challenges, when it comes to fishery and the reorganization of, of, of fishery in, in Europe. Um, so you know Europe from inside and you have a very clear idea what Europe is, can be, and, and, and should be in the future. Um, and 
after your role in the commission, um, you have also led a think tank and a, and a uh, well in a known uh, conference, which is the European Forum Alpbach, that assembles thousands of, of of thinkers every year to to think about the, the future direction of Europe. So, who else could tell us where to go and 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 why a European university might play a role here? Please, Dr. Fischler, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you from my side. Uh, I was told that I should uh, give a little bit a frame where we are uh, living at the moment here in Europe, but not only here in Europe, also beyond. And I'm keen to do that. And after that, I will make some comments about the scientific landscape in the future and also give some practical uh, ideas how we could make uh, progress in this field. So uh, let us be clear. We are now living in a different world, uh, in a new age. Since uh, Mr. Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, uh, almost two years ago, and uh, even more so with the conflict in Gaza, uh, the European project as a peace project is at risk. The second remark I would like to make is that uh, there is a, a power change in the world going on. So the new big powers are US and China, and uh, there's a risk similar to the risk which we were facing when the European Union was founded, uh, that we would be squeezed between these two big powers. So therefore, we have to find our role in the world. A third comment I would like to make is that uh, the European values uh, the evidence-based science uh, is one of these European val values, uh, and uh, <clears throat> these values are primarily coming from enlightenment. And here, I think we must be very careful to keep these val values and to promote these values worldwide, not only here in Europe. And then... We are facing a new uh, scientific landscape. Think about artificial intelligence. Think about new um, new inventions in biotechnology. Think about ChatGPT. Whereby uh, about ChatGPT, it is, is not primarily the issue that, that the students have new instruments how to escape from uh, studying carefully uh, what they should study. It is more about the algorithms. And uh, there is more and more um, uh, common sense that this algorithm has the power to start a similar revolution uh, which we had in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. So, and all these together, <laughs> I think, uh, is really something uh, which we must discuss where we should find new ways forward, where we should uh, also agree what we have to defend uh, for our children and grandchildren and so on and so forth. So uh, this is not only an issue for diplomacy. It is an issue for all of us. And uh, when we today discuss the internationalization of uh, the European applied sciences, then I think the first thing we must do is we must strengthen the European networks in this field. Only if we are strong enough, only then we can uh, reap uh, benefit for others. And uh, it, I think it should be a more practical approach how we can make progress here. So, uh, for example, uh, I see uh, several opportunities uh, for, a, 
fruitful internationalization. Uh, we should, for example, remember our historical relations, which have the European countries with uh, different uh, with uh, different other parts in the world. For example, uh, the Austrians have a long-standing tradition with the Balkan countries. I think here is a field uh, for closer cooperation. And uh, similar, uh, I mean, for all of us, and even now with uh, the Trumpism, uh, the strengthening of the transatlantic uh, <clears throat> cooperation is of utmost importance. And uh, for example, Spain and Portugal, they have long-standing traditions with South America. France, UK, Netherlands, Belgium, they have traditional relations to Africa. So I think we can build on that, uh, on that historical relations and revive them uh, where necessary. And in that way, I think it is easier to overcome uh, the still existing preoccupations, especially in Africa, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the neocolonialism and, and, and other developments. But uh, we must also look to the most advanced uh, countries in the world, to those countries uh, from whom we can learn uh, something. And here is still U.S. very important, but more and more also China, especially uh, in relation to artificial intelligence. But uh, there are also some other interesting countries with whom we should cooperate. For example, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and so on. And uh, apart from these uh, possibilities of mutual learning, uh, for the future of Europe, the most important contin continent is Africa. And cooperation with Africa requires not only uh, at the political and diplomatic uh, level cooperation, it requires also, uh, and I would say uh, most importantly, uh, more cooperation in the business sector. And uh, for that, in addition, clearly uh, a fundamental uh, uh, scientific fundament uh, is uh, important. And um, I think uh, it would be good if uh, Europe could do more. Uh, for example, that European universities and also universities for applied science, uh, sciences uh, could have each of them a partner university somewhere in Africa. Uh, there, are, there are young universities there with uh, uh, not staffed good enough. Also, uh, they need also investment in laboratories and so on and so forth. And here, I think uh, support should be given primarily uh, from the European Union, but also from uh, national governments. And um, in that way, I think uh, we can really make the necessary progress. And this is urgent. Uh, so we can't wait anymore. We can't wait until China has, <laughs> has more partnerships with Africa uh, than Europe. And... Um, in addition to that, I think it could also be interesting uh, to develop a systematic exchange of uh, scientific staff, uh, maybe also students. I think uh, uh, apart from the student exchange program in, in Brussels, uh, we, uh, it would be interesting to develop a second program which goes beyond uh, European exchange uh, and includes also especially Africa. And uh, for that, we, are, we have this year European elections. And I think uh, we would be well advised if we could develop a kind of proposal or at least uh, some ideas 
and uh, sent them uh, to the responsible uh, staff in the European Commission and uh, also to the uh, future uh, to the to the future commissioners and in that way i think uh, we would have a mutual profit africa would uh, have a lot of profit from our experience we could have a lot of profit uh, in a closer cooperation and i think uh, step by step this is not uh, an issue which can be solved from one day to the other, uh, but step by step, I think uh, Europe could play really a, a, a crucial role, role uh, in the future development of not only our continent, but also the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Franz Fischler. Yeah, we, 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 you can't hear the applause, um, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, you addressed and, and uh, addressed some of the, the activities which are very close to our minds and very close to our hearts. So if we look into the, into the next plans for that go beyond Compass and this project, Africa is the next um, big challenge on our list together with South America. So in Uliseos, our rectors have uh, assembled and decided that um, after opening a branch in Asia, which is now Vietnam, the next two branches and, and the strategic partnerships will be established in Africa and, 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 and South America. So thank you very much for, um, yeah, um, supporting and underlining the, the importance of, of this, of this, of these opportunities, uh, or the necessity to, to, um, to, to establish a lot of civil societies, relationships, business relationships, relationships between universities and those two continents. And especially with Africa, I remember very well, uh, Franz Fischler, um, you gave already a speech in the, in the early 2000s, I think it was in 2008 here at MCI, um, uh, motivating us to, to build university partnerships with Africa. And I can also um, confirm that we have done so, so that there is already um, some partnerships, but those have to be stronger. And I understand that at a European scale, um, there is a lot to do because uh, China is hyperactive um, and is um, pumping a lot of resources and money and investments into different African countries. They do not always connect it to values or European values or to human rights, which makes it um, for some of the countries um, yeah, somehow easier to 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 connect with with china and 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 here we have to build on our tradition on our uh, heritage um, but also we also have to make sure that we overcome our colonial hangovers in the different european countries uh, in, in in order not to enter in a, in a new neo colonial uh, attitude or, or behavior if i understand you correctly so thank you very much for for um setting the floor and 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 for providing this this um space for for further engagement and also for underlining the role of European universities, universities in general, but European European university alliances in in particular, to 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 foster this agenda and to to lead to lead this 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 journey. Um, I would like to hand over to to Minister Frederic Vidal. Uh, Minister Frederic Vidal is a politician who has been engaged in higher education for a very long time. I think you were serving as a president of the University of Côte d'Azur when you received the, the, the call uh, from uh, your your government to to join the government as a minister for higher education. We also work very closely together with one of your colleagues, uh, Stefan Gomay, who was with you when you received that call and who joined you also on that journey for for quite a while. And and and, and that's why we know how much you have already contributed to this European University Alliance. Um, program and, and that you are still supporting the agenda at the European level, at the level of, of, of the, 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 the National uh, Ministry of Higher Education in France 
and uh, as a as a researcher and university manager madame vidal please the floor is yours thank you thank you very much for the invitation and uh, uh, i'm really very very pleased to be with you and to share my vision of the role of european alliances in international cooperation and the impact of uh, close coordination between science and diplomacy. So maybe in a few minutes, let, let me remind you what are the general objectives of the alliances. First, it was to achieve an optimal scope of cooperation, to be more visible internationally. And of course, to be able to produce IN research contributions in global challenges. Be also able to recruit the best professors and researchers attracted by the international challenges led by the alliances. Also contribute to the regional and to the regions where the alliance campuses are located with societal reach. Be able, of course, to enhance program selectivity to attract the best students, recruit a greater diversity of students, and make the most of multiculturalism. And finally, of course, enhance the student experience. So to succeed in international strategy, the first point is, in my opinion, knowledge of synergies that can be built by the alliances. What can an alliance offer that each of the universities that make it up cannot offer? The biggest risk is wanting to do everything or pretending to be able to do everything. So globalization has not only affected industry, it, has also, it is also impacting the sector of education, imposing an array of innovations and demands. Knowledge creation requires strong innovation skills and entrepreneurial mindset. It mobilizes diverse teams of researchers and interconnected experts. In other words, it results from the joint efforts of various stakeholders. Knowledge sharing and interconnections must be supported by collaborative devices and tools. Each alliance must find its singularity, its signature, and use the strategic links already established with the partners of each of its members. So Ulysses did that because it explained that its unique and distinguished feature is to, to, be, to be understood as an innovation ecosystem, developing solutions for specific research and development challenges from innovation hubs. The two main challenges remain to gain in agility and fluidity in the decision-making process, and of course, to strengthen the links with the corporate world. The question of the added value for me is crucial, and it is on this basis that Europe can become aware of the strength of these alliances. It is necessary to move forward on the question of the legal personality of alliances on the question of mobility of students and researchers, on the question of attractivity, and on the questions of specific and long-term fundings. The second point uh, to construct an international strategy is to understand what are the expectations of the countries with which an alliance wants to cooperate. Very often, scientific and academic cooperation is based on interpersonal relationships. Of course, it is important and it must continue within the framework of relations between research laboratories. But this has nothing to do with an international cooperation strategy. The real added value is found in the framework of cooperation based on the expectations and needs of partners and in connection with diplomacy. And this subject of the strategy also raises the question of the level of training to be co-constructed between higher education establishments to participate in the competitiveness and in developing the economic fabric of the other regions. What are the employment market needs? 
what our skill needs, and how do we build a network that will ultimately ensure the academic, scientific, and innovation autonomy of the country is concerned. The final objective is to allow students to find a job at a large variety of companies in their country of origin or internationally. In addition to cutting-edge course content, the employability shame must be revamped for a better efficiency and can be implemented in a blended mode combining mentoring, seminar, events, and of course the use of online dedicated tools. All of these questions require a long-term commitment. It is for this reason that reflection must be done at the highest level of governance. And it is one of these conditions that Europe will be able to commit to long-term financing. Alliances must demonstrate that they contribute to the development and the sustainable performance of their partners worldwide for their ability to innovate and to develop societal and technical skills through their transdisciplinarity and international culture. And by the way, that they contribute to the development of the regions and, country, and countries in which they are located. Finally, the third point concerns the construction of a real win-win relationships. What will be the academic, but also economic and diplomatic benefits of these international relations? How can companies participate in the necessary investment? So let me take just two examples. The first concerns cooperation between Germany and Kenya on renewable energies. After signing the cooperation agreement on geothermal energy, Germany and Kenya are now turning to the question of solar energy storage. Young Kenyans have been trained on this subject. The research laboratories of the two countries collaborate on an equal level. Kenya today produces 90% of its energy from renewable sources. And German companies have established themselves in Kenya to participate to the construction of factories and solar plants. It is the same logic that governed the ongoing construction of the Franco-Senegalese University. We have identified three subjects of interest for Senegal, agriculture, including water management and ecosystem preservation, health and the management of health, and finally, data mining to ensure the sustainable development of these two priorities. The French Development Agency financed the creation of training adapted to these challenges. Doctoral students came to train in France and then participate in training and research in Senegal and French companies have invested in these subjects. So the primary purpose of the Franco-Senegalese University is really to stimulate and support the maturation and development of innovative projects between Senegalese and French establishments in the field of training, research, and innovation transfer. It is not only to issue diplomas. This is therefore another way for European universities to think about their role in development related to diplomacy in line with the expectations of the countries concerned and in connection with business. Alliances are expected to train future graduates with a solid culture of innovation by creating new programs, adjusting curricula to company needs and local opportunities this framework should leverage the impact of research and innovation to tackle systemic global challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, environmental pollution, and to achieve the sustainable development goals, thereby creating better livelihoods for all. The process of building such partnerships must not only account for technical and organizational aspects, but must also encompass their respective partner needs and interests to ensure mutual respect, equity, and transparency. The multi-campus system of alliances in the European Union and elsewhere must be considered as a network of connected hubs 
supporting by cutting edge technologies, but also allowing personal experience of globalization, multiculturalism, with a transdisciplinary approach of programs and research. They must offer transversal learning outcomes and locally contextualized course content linked to the job market. Consideration of economic, environmental, social stakes in all programs to foster students' understanding of the contemporary world and the ability to see the world as a sandpit for creativity. Innovation must be considered as a driver of development and change in all fields, entrepreneurship, pedagogical innovation, research. And it means, it means evolving in synergy with local and international companies to develop students and future graduates for a globalized world who are responsible, open, mobile, with a respect for diversity and ready for jobs anywhere in the world. And it means asking the companies to invest in alliances. To conclude, I just would like to mention that it is not only universities that must change their mindset in building international cooperation. It is essential that countries and the European Union become aware of the huge development potential that universities and alliances constitute. Diplomatic strategies must take into account and diplomats must, must rely on academics. And as I already said, stable and long-term financing from EU and EU countries is essential. We must move away from, from top-down management from north to south. And in the example that Ulysses has built in Denham, for example, with the support of its partners and of Vietnamese government, it's a real success. And I think that it really can be considered as a model for international relationship of the alliances. Thank you. Again, we have to applaud symbolically here as we can't see the, 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 the other audience. Thank you so much, uh, Frederic Vidal, for, for, for your statement and introduction and the, the role of the European universities. I think you, you outlined very in, in in very detail how important it is that universities what you do what universities have to do so it's about employability it's about excellence in research uh, it's about um, success for our students and 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 uh, partners stakeholders business partners uh, where we play a facilitating enabling uh, supporting uh, creating role um, i think you also nicely exemplified uh, with two examples both from Africa. I think you are perfectly aligned with Franz Fischler uh, in, in, in this case. So you, you focused on Africa in the two examples from Kenya and, and, and Senegal by, by showing and demonstrating how long-term commitment of university alliances, uh, universities, countries, uh, the businesses uh, uh, can um, be organized and, and, and done in a way that they serve the societal needs, that they address the global challenges and, 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 and uh, uh, create impact at the local level. You also mentioned at the very beginning the relevance of the European Universities Alliances and its innovation hubs for its own ecosystems in our countries. So we are not only acting as a global alliance to serve a global society, but we very much connect our strengths and forces to make a difference for our local business environment, for our local communities, for our local societies, in, in order to, to bundle our knowledge and experience for the benefit of our cities and regions. So this is quite a, a broad uh, challenge. And if I may ask all of you, how would you see how well are we already performing or what else does it need to connect this um, global uh, approach um, and 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 this think global um, approach with with the act local uh, activities and, and and local in this case is not only locally um, imp uh, creating local impact in Kenya and and Senegal and Vietnam but also 
um, assuring that our societies funding our European universities understand that this also pays back into our own regions. How can we do it and how can we do it better? Oh. Uh, whoever wants to start. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I can, yeah. Maybe I, I can. I can try to to start to answer. Yeah, probably the the most important thing is to have a strong connection and to be confident between universities, uh, companies, and stakeholders in, in general and citizens. Um, I think that everything is a is a question of. Um, of really building together something that will uh, works, of course, but also that that will be able to to develop in the long term. I mean, we start something, but we have to think about the future and to think how it will survive to our own person. And for me, it's really the the most important point. So when you think about your region, your ecosystem, your um, uh, political and, and societal um, um, partners, you can cast, construct something very strong and uh, everybody will continue to work to make it happen. Thank you very much. Let, let me add a few thoughts uh, to the statement uh, <clears throat> of uh, Mrs. Uh, Vidar. Uh, first of all, I think uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, if I take again the example of Africa, but it's not only with Africa, it's almost in all the underdeveloped uh, world, in all the developing countries the same. Um, the fact that the cooperation is coming from a Christian uh, tradition, mainly based on charity. And uh, charity, uh, I don't criticize charity, charity is good, but not enough. And what is most needed and uh, very urgent is that we professionalize the relations with these countries in all parts of the business sector, in uh, the science, the different science sectors. Uh, and, uh, and this is the reason why I think uh, the best would be, because, uh, I mean, there's no fit, uh, no thing which fits uh, all. Yeah? Uh, so you must individualize. And uh, with this, with a concept of partnerships uh, on a university base, uh, this could help to find out uh, faster and better what the needs are and also what the benefits are on, and the benefits on both sides. It's not only the benefit uh, for uh, a university in Africa. It's also, we can uh, profit a lot from such uh, corporations. And uh, I think... Uh, the, for that, a support scheme, to develop a support scheme at the European level would uh, be very helpful and uh, would uh, give the opportunity to intensify uh, the relations. And only uh, if we work on the concept of partnerships, so uh, not we, the well-established and uh, the European, the arrogant Europeans who know everything, uh, no. Uh, I think uh, the values which can uh, be contributed from the other side are evenly important. And, uh, and this, I think, is something we must learn. Thank you. Andreas, may I invite you to, to also join this conversation? If I may come in here, I strongly support uh, what uh, Frederic Vital and uh, Franz Fischler have said. 
uh, we, first of all, when looking to so-called uh, underdeveloped countries, those who, uh, who are willing uh, to be taken at their hands and who we work together, especially, for instance, in Africa, but also in other continents and areas of the world, I strongly support the idea that we should uh, refrain from uh, the idea of charity and give presents and gifts and so on. But what we shall do, and we're also responsible, I think, to do that, is to provide opportunities. Okay? So uh, not uh, gifts, not presents, but opportunities. That means collaborations. That means investments. That means partnerships. That means uh, and so on. But it's, again, about opportunities. And more or less, that not only applies to perhaps international partners, wherever they are, that also applies to our youth within Europe, uh, especially within, you know, these uh, the, the German-speaking concept. And I think very much also the one in, in France and other countries and Spain and in our Ulysses partner countries. Very often the concept is that we shall please our youth uh, with uh, take away all the stones out of their of, of their path, uh, provide them with uh, with presents, uh, with social welfare. Nothing against social welfare wherever it is needed, but you shouldn't spoil them. People do not want to be uh, gifted uh, or be be gifted, yes, but uh, be pleased with presence. What they need is chances and opportunities, and especially that is also the 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 the, the idea of research innovation. How should you qualify them? How should you uh, enable them uh, to stand on their own ways to be? Uh, equivalent partners and perhaps even lead the path in the future in, in the global sc uh, uh, scale. Nothing against that. Form partnerships, and I think that is very, very much the idea of uh, beyond Europe, of uh, Horizon and Compass, and especially on the on uh, reaching out from Ulysses and other European countries to other continents, to academic uh, institutions and researchers and research institutions all over the place. Thank you, Andreas. I, I think that matches very well with a statement in the in the audience. Uh, Mozart Marin says the alliances between universities, companies, governments have to be seen as an entrepreneurial journey with a vision, a mission not to be defined only by a goal or a project or a certain number of students. Uh, uh, it has to be a long term action. And I, I think we all agree with that. And if I if I uh, may add a question here, um, especially to our two former ministers, uh, Franz Fischloser has served as the, at the national government here in Austria. Uh, what is the, the the challenge for our national governments when it comes to the support of these global <clears throat> global endeavors? as European universities in global collaboration. How can these challenges be effectively addressed from a, from a national government's point of view? Uh, if I may come Please. in here. Um, well, first, uh, I would uh, like to make a short comment on what was said before because this seems to be really very important. Yeah? Uh, the Germans, uh, for example, have learned uh, their lesson, uh, how, how sensitive these issues are. Uh, when they organized the big summit in uh, Bavaria some years ago, uh, then uh, they thought uh, the contribution uh, of Germany could be uh, to develop a Marshall Plan for Africa. This is how they called it or named it. But uh, this was not very well received in Africa. It was very much criticized in Africa. Then they changed a little bit the wording. They, uh, the Germans said then, well, a, a Marshall Plan with Africa. Uh, and uh, also this concept was criticized by the Africans because they had the feeling it is again the dominant Europe, like uh, Mr. Marshall was for the U.S., uh, representing the U.S. after the Second World War. And uh, they uh, and uh, the Africans have to accept what uh, the Europeans are telling them. 
So uh, I think this is not the right way. The right way is exactly uh, what we, how it was described before. Uh, the second, uh, your question, uh, in relation to the national responsibilities. Well, here the situation is very much uh, different uh, because we in Europe, we have countries without experience uh, of colonialism. Uh, the Austrians, for example, had never a colony, but others had colonies. And um, you can also see the difference between East and West Africa, uh, how long uh, this, the effects of uh, colonialism uh, are still important nowadays. Uh, so uh, we, for example, in Austria, primarily uh, we should we, we should be uh, we should stick more to our obligations. Uh, because, as you, as all of you know, it's more than you know, forty years now that every year this uh, the summit in New York of the UN uh, says once again, zero point seven percent of GDP should be given uh, for uh, development cooperation. So Austria is at the moment at the level of zero point three. And uh, there are only very few who who fulfill hundred uh, percent the obligation of this zero point seven percent. So, uh, apart from the amount, the question is also, um, and here I think Austria is doing a rather good job uh, that each national government should also have a number of partners. Uh, Austria has uh, chosen, I think, eight countries uh, who, are, uh, who are the partner countries with whom uh, there, is a close, uh, there is a closer cooperation. But this has to be organized Europe-wide so that each national state has certain partners and uh, and in, in overall, we should, uh, in that way, uh, meet all the interests of uh, the countries in the third in the third world. But we should also not forget, apart from the development cooperation, the importance of cooperation, especially with uh, with uh, universities who are the front runners in the international development uh, with American universities, with Asian universities, with uh, Korean universities and so on. Uh, so I think there are also opportunities for us in Europe to learn uh, from uh, those front runners and, uh, and uh, to, to make more rapidly progress in the in their research work. Thank you, thank you, Franz Fischler, Madame Pidai. Uh, your your mic is off. Yes, uh, I I totally agree with uh, what uh, Franz said. M maybe just um, a few additional points. I think that for government, it is very important to. Um, to enlarge the students' international experience. And to, we know that when we uh, speak about uh, exchanging students, there's a lot of students coming from south to north and very few students uh, going from north to south. And to, to do that, we really need to create collaboration on equal level. And that's why it is a long-term project, because in some countries, we first have to train professors and researchers. And then in their own countries, they can welcome all students. So it's really, I think, very important to, to work on this idea of real cooperation and, and not uh, top-down um, solutions. And it is the same for um, uh, 
at the development uh, agency of each country. Um, the question is the question of influence. Uh, if if you are able to help country or to give the opportunity, I, I agree, uh, of, of course, with Andreas, to give the opportunity to other countries to develop their own economy. So if you do that as a country or as European Union, you, you have influence on the economy of this country and your own companies can also be involved. And it is in that way that, for example, uh, Chinese um, uh, works, they, they first offer your opportunities and then, of course, they are very well um, um, recognized in the countries that uh, to which they, they give this uh, opportunity. So the first thing is is really to have a more international uh, and and students ready to work everywhere in the world. And the second idea is really to work to have uh, real competencies real research laboratories uh, in all the countries in which we want to develop cooperation. Thank you very much. And and, and, and in, in both of your um, answers is, is somehow also embedded that the necessity for the for the resources. So from a national point of view, if uh, a country doesn't fulfill its uh, globally committed obligation to to invest in this in this global cooperation how can these kind of alliances strive uh, and, and 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 be successful looking at the broad agenda that uh, has been put on on european university alliances so if i may add the question here maybe also to andreas um this collaboration includes a lot. We want to be attractive for, for talent from all over the world. We want to strengthen research, enhancing student mobility, fostering European values. Um, how can we handle all of that? Uh, not only as alliance, but also in line with our local responsibilities to our local government and, 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 and to the uh, individual university strategies. How can we align all these strategies and, and, and balance all these out? beyond the question of resources. Many thanks to Siegfried and uh, Franz and Frederick for your comments and uh, now handing the word to me. Now, first of all, uh, I would like to add something uh, to what has, has been said. I think we also should strongly, strongly focus uh, aside of uh, or and beyond Africa and, and Asia and so on, but strongly also on the global uh, compa uh, global uh, leaders in in technology like Japan, like uh, like South Korea, France. You've you've mentioned that on Taiwan and so on. As this is uh, also call it a global power play of values, uh, of uh, of uh, strategic interests and so on. So. Uh, also try to bring them in into our boat to connect to them to to uh, work together with them and to uh, and to create win-win opportunities that's the one comment i would like to add now how can we align these uh, different expectations interests and so on and and uh, now uh, we all have uh, some duties or expectations or a mission to play it in, uh, in our home countries and perhaps in our own regions. I think, again, the idea of opportunities uh, is of value. Now, where, if not at the university, where, if not when studying, Shall you prepare as a young, uh, uh, or shall we prepare our young generation to be global, uh, to 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 have global knowledge, to create global networks, to understand other regions, other thoughts, our cultures? How, where, if not at the university when studying, and then doing research and innovation? Where and when, if not then and there? Uh, shall they learn how to move in an international cultural environment? And I think that is already, that more or less answers 
uh, the value of uh, of our missions and ambitions and and effort in our home countries and then strongly or stronger focusing on research and innovation that creates opportunities for our students here it creates opportunities for our corporate partners it creates opportunities for our society to create to uh, create wealth prosperity chances opportunities uh, wealth but again uh, technology innovation so important but again i think the joint mission and the joint thought the joint uh, uh, the joint uh, the joint basis of this beyond europe of compass and uh, now in this case uh, ulysses is to provide opportunities to create partnerships to to avoid the the the, the idea of charity but uh, to learn from each other and also please not just to provide opportunities to african countries or either or call it in uh, a bit in in the middle east or in india or wherever but also to learn from them see them as partners uh, i like the uh, idea and 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 uh, the, the the perception and also the expression of creating ma the martial plans with them uh, working together with them, but also learn from them and 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 create win-win opportunities. I think that is what can align uh, and uh, the the uh, our uh, these different interests uh, and also the the expectations we have to fulfill in our home countries. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to, to turn now to some of the, the, the questions that have been posted in, in our chat. Mozart Marines uh, is um, confirming, underlying what, what uh, Franz Fischler said about uh, the, the Marshall Plan initiative for, for Africa, that, that sometimes policymakers forget to ask those who are affected by these uh, initiatives. And she brings in another example from England where uh, coca planters were not uh, being involved in a plan to um, help them to develop into potato uh, farming. So one other example. Siam Mansuri asks, um, I totally agree about the idea of equal collaboration. Um, and for this purpose, European universities need to look for and accept those cooperations with universities um, from what you have called under uh, developed countries. Um, they are also trying to meet international standards and to get accreditation, for example. So if I understand that correctly, it's also uh, one of our roles, not only to, to collaborate with those who have already developed all standards and who have already um, been accredited uh, along all kind of international standards for higher education and science, but also to, to, to develop and to work with those who are ambitious to work with the European University Alliance, but who need some capacity building support. And I, I think there is funds, especially for this type of capacity building. Um, John Rowell from University of Côte d'Azur asks, how can individual research institutes in a university uh, um, alliance contribute to participate in and benefit from the international strategy? So what is in there for individual institutes? Um, Madame Vidal, I, I know sometimes it's quite challenging when you build a merger with you merge different universities as you did in Nice. You know, now the University of Côte d'Azur assembles a, a group of universities and suddenly the researchers had to change their affiliations. Um, how is that when you when you convince researchers and institutes to, to change their affiliation and to use the University of Côte d'Azur and, uh, and, 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 and maybe not the, the individual institute for, for their research? In fact, it is exactly the same mindset as uh, we spoke. Uh, you have to co-construct. I mean, um, if you sometimes you have um, laboratories or researchers who want to be leaders in this kind of uh, cooperation. And of course, you must rely on them. You must ask them to co-construct projects. 
And then uh, when the other can see that the experience is working very well, they also wanted to join. So the first thing is really to define a strategy. I, I, I really think that you can't say that you can do everything. You have to choose where you are strong to do something. Then you have to construct the project with all the stakeholders, of course, researchers, but also uh, citizens, companies, uh, regional authorities, local authorities, in order to really understand what is needed. Because if you answer to a real need, you will succeed. If you try to imagine what are the needs of other people, you will probably fail. And, and then you can start with few people who are attracted by this kind of challenge. And then by the example of success, you will attract all the others. So the question is, is really construct the project and then put the right boxes for uh, organization and, and so on. But don't start to draw the box and then say to people, go inside. It will not work. Thank you. Wonderful. And if I may uh, use this co-creation approach also to to reflect on the comments from Sia Mansuri and, and Mozart Marines. Um, but before I do that, Franz Fischler, you raised your hand, please. Yes, uh, I would like to add something uh, because uh, these very practical questions are very important uh, for the individual universities. So first of all, uh, it must be clear that uh, there is a difference uh, between the possibilities which exist at the national level and the possibilities at the European level. And uh, at the national level, I think there is the best way to, <laughs> to get in contact with the responsible ministries. Uh, but I would recommend uh, as one possible outcome of our conference today uh, that we make aware the responsible people in Brussels of uh, what we are willing to do and uh, that there is an interest for more international cooperation. So I, I would recommend to send a letter to the research commissioner and uh, in copy to the director general of the DG research and uh, tell them, uh, he, look, here are a number of universities willing to go beyond Europe, willing to cooperate uh, with universities outside Europe. But uh, to realize or to, to make this uh, happen, uh, we need uh, whatever you then uh, write in the letter what the needs are. So I, th I think we should be very practical in these things. Because if we only discuss amongst us how important all these things are, I mean, we must not no longer convince each other uh, we are all <laughs> on the same line. But uh, what we must uh, do is that we make uh, the responsible persons in Brussels aware of what we need. And uh, I think at this stage, it's a good opportunity because uh, the commission is an outgoing commission, so uh, maybe, therefore, they could uh, add to uh, something to their programs. Because the, the practical problem for them is that they can only act within an existing program. And uh, what we would need are some uh, additional elements in the existing programs or uh, a very specific programs for those what we would like to do. Thank you very much, Franz Fischler, for yeah this this um, assignment. I would say yeah I, I feel we feel as we say is responsible to 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 not only write this letter to collect the the arguments that we have to bring to the commission to organize the the, the, the meetings and conferences in Brussels to be in touch with the, the general directors and the the, the, the different um, policy officers to, to shape the agenda. And I think Siam Mansouri, who mentioned that sometimes uh, an accreditation is required in order to apply for a proposal, but the university you want to work with 
also asks you for the same accreditation might be one of the points we have to address in order to, to build some facilitating structures and support structures to get into an Erasmus Plus charter if you haven't done that before and, and, and other, uh, other schemes which are necessary for cooperation. So Sia Mansuri, please reach out to me and to us and, and let's see what we and how we can do that for you and how we can organize that for that so that we build an umbrella that is a bit wider. Um, thank you for the uh, for the comments from the audience. We are moving towards the end of this morning session. I think we have a few seconds um, less uh, left, and I, therefore I would like to move all further questions to the afternoon session, which starts in in one hour. Um, we continue at twelve forty um, with uh, Stefan Bergman from the European Universities Association. To make it correct, now um, representing universities from all over Europe and 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 also supporting the different alliances with a lot of accompanying policy work and 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 research, and he will be um, uh, joined by Jessica Schiller and uh, Jason Lane, both from Seabird and uh, specialist uh, experts in cross-border and international higher education and research cooperation. So we will continue in exactly one hour, and I would like to, to, to leave the last uh, word to our three um, panelists um, in, in, in order to give us a, a final advice or your dream for Europe and, and our role as European universities before we close this session. Please, in, in, in this case, I would like to, to start with Andreas as you started um, already in the morning, please. I think uh, the European university idea has been uh, prepared to uh, pursue dreams and the dream to make Europe again uh, one of the, and keep Europe and make it uh, uh, to one of the global leaders in technology, innovation, research, and so on. But not to do that alone, but to reach out uh, and connect uh, with the world and to create win-win opportunities. And that is, I think, what shall be done. And that is also what we at the MCI within Ulysses, what we work uh, strongly for, and uh, that we, we will be happy to share this dream. So I think, uh, more or less, that is our joint mission entry. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Madame Vidal, please. Thank you. Oh, if, if I have a, a wish, to, to do is really to, and um, what uh, Franz said is really very important, to really make the link between education and research at the European level for European alliances. We, we can't separate education and research and innovation in the alliance and if we want to have a, a real impact. So for me, it's very important to, of course, uh, be in, in link with uh, uh, DG education, but also with uh, DG research. And I think that um, in that case, we, we can really dream to inspire again um, all the young people everywhere who really wanted to, to have an impact. You know, when you ask the, the youth what is important for them, for the future. They all say that they want to have a life with sense and that they want to have an impact on the society. And I think that we can do that with European alliances. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's not much uh, to add uh, from uh, my side, uh, but maybe one last thought. Uh, and this is, I think, in my view, uh, to some degree, uh, what we are discussing uh, here when we speak about universities is uh, uh, self-explaining insofar that in it includes universal. Yeah, And uh, being universal is the job of universities. And if we go along that line, I think we are on the right track. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much for these encouraging words to, to all of you. Thank you very much for the profound and powerful discussion and for setting the stage for our Beyond Europe uh, conference, but also for the Beyond Europe activities uh, in Ulysseus. I'm very much looking forward to the next session in the afternoon, sustaining international R&I collaborations outside the EU, challenges and success factors. We will go into some more details. We'll move some of the questions from this morning in the afternoon. And now I wish you a nice lunch break and see you at exactly 12.40 again here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Siegfried. Welcome back, everyone. We on. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you um, for the second part of the session of this Compass Conference on Beyond Europe. Um, the second part will be addressing the topic of sustaining international research and innovation collaboration outside the European Union, challenging and success factor. Um, this afternoon, we're going to have uh, three speakers um, that we are very, um, very happy to receive today. Um, the first speaker is uh, Stefan Bergmans, and he's the Director of Research and Innovation at the European University um, Association. Um, the European University Association is a forum that enables enables cooperation and exchange of information on higher education and research policies. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Stefan. And Stefan will be uh, talking about challenges in sustaining international r &I collaborations. Um, then the presentation by Stefan will be followed by a Q&A session. So please feel free to post your questions on the chat. Um, we'll be more than happy to answer. Um, the second part of this second uh, session, um, we will have uh, Jessica Schuller and Jason Lane who will be presenting um, success factors for long-term global partnership. Uh, Jason Lane is the president of the National Association of Higher Education System, is also the co-director of the CBERT, CBERT being the cross-border education research team, and they mainly do research uh, and track development in cross-border higher education. Uh, Jessica Schuller is a researcher and a consultant. She's the founder of Career Coaching for Internationals in Germany. She's a project manager and also a researcher at uh, Siebert. Um, I have to say that for both Seabird uh, and uh, the European um, uh, Association, uh, we've been using for the purpose of the Compass project and English project project a lot of their resources so we're very grateful to have them today and have them speak about these different topics um i will give the floor to uh stefan uh, if you want to start thank you very much and thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh to be with you today and for inviting uh eua to speak on this very important topic of uh r &I collaboration international r &I collaboration do you see my slide Yes, we can. Good, perfect. So uh, I'll start right away because um, uh, what I want to stress is, yes, you mentioned uh, EUA and who we are. So I just want to stress that I'll be speaking not just for alliances, but more broadly for universities. Huh? Our membership is about 900 members. Uh, and this goes well beyond the EU, by the way. You can see that we're in 51 countries. It also includes uh, uh, 35 national rectors conference also. So uh, that gives us uh, somewhat of uh, some uh, a very broad perspective. So I'll be speaking uh, on, on that behalf. And what I want to do today very quickly is first give you this overall perspective uh, for universities. That includes the agendas we've developed at EUA for uh, research and innovation. And then I'll try to go into some specific examples that I think, but I'd be happy to uh, discuss this with you. Uh, you know, are, are places where alliances can definitely uh, can definitely play a role. So what I'd like to start with is, well, of course, uh, international r and collaboration is really of strategic importance uh, for universities. And this is clearly stated in the strategic plan of the EOA, where the missions of our member universities are indeed uh, global in scope. And they serve society not just at the local level, obviously, but also around the world. This is also uh, present in the Universities Without Walls, which is the vision uh, for 2030, vision for universities that, published, that was published by EUA in 2021. 
And there, uh, one of the challenges that's identifying is the fact that the world order is indeed changing. Uh, and this was, by the way, in 2021. So you can imagine how much more it has changed since. But it, of course, research, innovation, and education are increasingly important factors in geopolitics. So Europe's universities must share and co-create knowledge at a global scale. And this is against a backdrop of foreign interference, uh, security threats, and political uh, worries about Europe's technological and strategic autonomy. So this really requires Europe uh, universities to make very delicate assessment of collaborations based on their uh, academic values. One of the factors for success that was identified also in this vision is the enabling framework. And in this case, we're talking about, uh, of course, including uh, the support to transnational collaboration uh, among uh, European uh, university. So um, this also was translated into uh, the uh, EUA RNI agenda that we just published in December. Uh, in, in terms of global context, it's quite clear that Europe's position in the global RNI landscape has come under uh, increasing scrutiny because it faces fierce competition from regions such as Asia and North America, where we see a really rapidly scaling up uh, their uh, RNI efforts and investment. Yet many of the values and perspectives that underpin RNI are global. So it is an open question if the leadership ambitions of any region do fit into a global whole that ideally should be driven instead uh, by a good balance between competition on the one hand and open cooperation and exchange on the other hand. And in this context, many countries across the world have started to address international cooperation in RI. And the European Commission, for example, recently published its global approach uh, it's called Europe's Strategy for International Cooperation in a Changing World. And the strategy does stress that EU should continue to lead by example to preserve openness uh, in international RNI cooperation while also promoting a level playing field and preserving the EU's uh, strategic autonomy uh, in some critical sectors. So those geopolitical assertions by the EU and also security concerns among its member states are rising in view of, uh, well, as you well know, increased global crisis and uh, economic uncertainty. So the situation we have today is that while openness is still acknowledged by the EU, it does not fully translate and match political practices. So that's a very uh, important element to keep in mind. Um, so Within you know our RNI agenda, we do provide a global context, and uh, we are in this case really in a in a process, in an ongoing process, one that is trying to reconcile uh, this commitment of Europe to openness, as I was mentioning, but also the political commitment to leadership and autonomy. So rather than seeing this in terms of rivalry, a more constructive and globally beneficial outcome could depend on Europe accepting that a truly open international context may also facilitate leadership uh, from newly emerging science powerhouses, at least in some uh, areas of, uh, of research innovation. And so therefore, even if openness bolsters contenders uh, for global leadership uh, at the expense of Europe's front runner status, these contenders should not automatically be seen as rivals as long as scientific cooperation remains possible. And of course, maintaining such cooperation is really crucial for Europe's universities, because as you know very well, uh, universities are engaged in RI partnerships around the world. They build bridges through projects between different universities, but also between different countries, different stakeholders. So while RI needs to be above politics whenever possible, the uh, EU way in its response to the European strategy for co international collaboration did stress that for universities, there is and there must be an international role. Universities should not only be instrumental for foreign policy goals, but more importantly, universities need to be central, independent and active institution in global RNI co cooperation. And universities can strive for openness while still managing the risk of foreign uh, interference. 
Uh, so now let me go to the three priorities actually of the UAR and I agenda. Uh, you see them here. I'll focus first on priority number three, which is about championing a well-designed uh, and sustainable RNI uh, system. And there you can see that one of the key elements uh, is collaboration towards this uh, Vision 2030 that EUA uh, has. So uh, what we have is uh, in uh, co for collaborations, uh, we have three objectives really. And one is about the fact that of course, uh, the transnational RNI collaboration has increased. Uh, and this is in the context of the EU programs initiatives, but also notably uh, the, the framework program. And of course, talking to alliances today in the context of the European Universities uh, Initiative. So that's quite important. And we need to have the right funding and the right regulatory framework here. We also stress the role of RNI infrastructures. And here, I think alliances also have a, a, a role to play because these can play a role in capacity building, but more importantly, also collaboration. This can be international also. So there too, funding, uh, training, a broader access regulations need to be uh, right. And then finally, the topic that I already uh, touched upon, which is security. And here, I think that uh, this is affecting uh, the uh, the um, you know potentially the universities in terms of their academic values, but also their performance in in, in research innovation, and so we need to understand to monitor and to respond to that uh, very uh, very carefully. So that's why uh, what we aim to do, but I think alliances can think about also their role here is definitely we will be looking into uh, the uh, RNI collaboration schemes that exist. Uh, in Europe and globally, including alliances. So very happy to collaborate on that. Uh, we will promote, of course, uh, the role of uh, research and innovation infrastructure. Uh, that includes, of course, uh, for collaboration. And as I was saying, we will monitor very carefully uh, the potential impact on universities uh, uh, of security. So uh, now moving still within priority three, another strong element that you can imagine even for collaboration, of course, uh, a, a, is the funding aspect. And here, what has been emerging this year and which will be with us for the next uh, uh, few years until 2027 is definitely, of course, uh, the uh, next framework program, uh, FP10. There we have, uh, we are preparing right now our vision. We're finalizing it. So I can already share with you that within there, we've got some recommendations and uh, some you know, are calling for providing more funding opportunities for collaborative research uh, projects. So that's clearly something that, uh, uh, you know, collaboration stands out as a fundamental strength of the uh, framework program. And that's, you know, cross-border, but also intersectoral partnership. And of course here, uh, it could increase the program's impact and FP10 should strengthen the relationship between all RNI actors, including the international one. There's also a recommendation about ensuring responsible openness as the default option for global cooperation in FP10. The global challenges that the framework program aims to tackle require actually global solutions. So the program should keep its door open for international cooperation with RNI partners from uh, countries that share actually EU's values. And in this context, Strategic autonomy needs to be a very specific exception to the rule by carefully identifying the areas and the sectors where it should take precedence over collaboration uh, with global uh, partners. We also have in the uh, uh, in our vision that's coming a section on international cooperation. Here, in terms of the context, uh, it's clear that the framework program uh, does stand out as a crucial instrument. Uh, to advance EU global ambitions. And the program's international openness has played a, a, a real pivotal role in fostering collaboration in RNI beyond the EU uh, and integrating, for example, a science diplomacy approach within the program has been particularly uh, effective. We also see that there's, as I said, growing political tensions. This was mentioned this morning also, and rising global challenges are currently uh, creating a new paradigm uh, for international r and uh, cooperation, no need to go further. But finally, also a complex landscape that regulates the access to associated and third countries to the various components of the framework program have emerged. And I think that here, in the absence of clear guidelines with such a complex framework, researchers and universities are really at risk of missing opportunities 
to collaborate uh, internationally. Um, so that's why we have those other recommendations. I mean, one you've seen before about uh, ensuring the uh, responsible openness. I won't go over that, but also the one about identifying, you know, selected research areas where strategic autonomy uh, should uh, should be favored over international cooperation. But again, very careful risk assessment is needed here, uh, obviously. Uh, now, still within priority three about a sustainable Orion uh, and well-designed RNI system, let me come back to security, because I think this is clearly one of the aspects where Alliance can play a role. Uh, when we, uh, and, and I've mentioned, of course, the impact of the topic of uh, knowledge security, uh, you know, on academic values and, and performance of RNI at universities. No need to re-explain that. But I think that one of the element also to stress is uh, that we need to have a well-balanced uh, and risk-appropriate approach because we need to recognize the importance of a, a key value for universities, which, which is autonomy. So what we will aim to do, and maybe something to be uh, thought about by alliances is first, is there a com common terminology? We talk about knowledge security, we talk about research security, we talk about dual use, foreign interference, a lot of terms used differently everywhere. So what we want to do definitely is uh, raise awareness. It's not the same everywhere in Europe, and we need to be able to raise awareness. And with that, also be able to share expertise and best practices, because there are some best practices already taking place in this topic in Europe. Moving to priority number one, I have another example around innovation. It might be a bit more far-fetched, but I think international collaboration can play a role. Priority number one focuses on a comprehensive understanding of innovation. The Commission in Europe has a view on innovation that's very much geared towards technology and commercial outputs. We believe that actually innovation is much broader than that. It's about co-creating, yes, in the end, uh, and transferring, but you know, generating uh, benefits such as economic benefit, but it goes beyond social benefits, environmental benefits, for example, organizational benefits. And in this case, I think that what is important is to promote this broader notion of entrepreneurship, learn from others elsewhere in the world how they perceive it, uh, exchange with them on this topic, because the idea also, and that's another important mission of, of alliances, is you know the, the training, uh, the education. So it's also about integrating entrepreneurship in this broader context within uh, all study programs, but also for staff themselves. So there, I think uh, alliances could play a role. And that's why we think that there should be uh, a facilitation of interest, uh, institutional dialogue and collaboration on boost, boosting this role of entrepreneurship in training, both for staff uh, and, and for students. And then what I'd like to finish with is priority number two. This one is about uh, uh, RNI cultures. And here I think there's clear role for alliances to play around assessment and more broadly open science. Because within our open science agenda at EUA, we clearly make the point that to be able to mainstream open science, it's now a global uh, endeavor. We cannot do it without participating with other stakeholders around the globe. And here, what we have is that we've seen policy frameworks emerge uh, beyond Europe. And so international collaboration is the only way to go forward to implement open science. Uh, it's recognized by uh, UNESCO. We at EUA, of course, will continue to work with other global partners, DORA, RDA, et cetera. But I think this is where alliances, where most, if not all of them, have open science within their uh, missions, uh, have actually a big role to play because they will be able to influence other players in you know globally with whom they collaborate. If we take the specific uh, aspect of uh, project number three for us, institutional approaches to research assessment, what we've started to do is implement actually uh, uh, our vision actually into uh, COARA. So the agreement on reforming research assessment that uh, we published with, Sci with Science Europe, with the UN, 350 other uh, stakeholders back in July 2022, and in, are, are, you know, have started implementing in the context of the coalition COARA. I think what's important to stress is that universities have a huge role to play here. Alliances, some alliances are already member, and you can see that more than 60% of membership are universities. That's why universities can play a, a role here. And not just that, 
what we see is the initiative is still at this level very European. Alliances could help spread this out globally. I've highlighted here the global players right now, but you can see more can be achieved. So I'll stop here. I think I've taken plenty of your time, but I'm more than happy, of course, now to have a conversation, hear your comments, uh, and of course, answer your questions if I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was a really interesting presentation. Uh, lots of, of of really good insights. And um, uh, to 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 talk about entrepreneurship, actually, we we at MCI, you you know that we're part of the Ulysses Alliance. That's that's our innovation about MCI, and and that's something that we've integrated quite quite strongly in Ulysses. So when you mentioned the topic of entrepreneurship, that that um, that's obviously something that 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 speak to us. Thank you very much. Um, I we we still have with us uh, Professor Franz Fischler, um, and we have a little bit of, of time. So um, Franz Fischler, would you like to to maybe address some questions or some comments to what has been presented by by Stefan? Well, in principle, I don't have uh, additional questions, uh, but uh, I think uh, it was a confirmation of, of what has to be done. Yeah? So he uh, he t told us uh, very clearly uh, the way forward, and uh, I think we should uh, follow his advice. I strongly agree. Thank you very much. Um, Siegfried, would you like to to do? Do you have questions, or would you like to to comment on, on what was presented? I think you muted Siegfried. We cannot hear you. Sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for for showing a, a direction, especially all the preparational work you are doing for the Tense Framework Program. And uh, there, there is a, a, a few new challenges, um, but I think the, the openness that you uh, expect us to, to maintain, also we have to be um, clear that there is more security concerns nowadays than, than, than uh, a few years ago, and that universities also have to play a, a role here in carefully selecting with whom they work on what. Um, we have to make sure that we that we stay as open as possibly and, and as academic as possibly. Thank you. Stefan, would you like to, to comment on that? Oh. <clears throat> oh, you muted. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I mean, it's great to hear the, from both of you that uh, we agree. I think that, uh, uh, you know, now it's more a question of uh, moving forward and implementing. Uh, I think we are facing both, as you were uh, mentioning, uh, Mr. Fischler, this morning, the global challenges such as climate, and that can only be resolved in 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 in, in the context of, of global cooperation. But then, on the other hand, indeed, the security concerns are you know uh, underlying this and somewhat threatening it. So I think we need to be very careful as we move forward. And and so it is only through the dialogue with UD alliances, universities more broadly, and our international partners that we'll be able to 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 move this forward. And so let's let's get down to work. And uh, uh, we're we're working on those topics more ha more than have to continue collaborating, of course, moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, before I address uh, some of the questions that are in the chat, uh, I have a few uh, questions maybe to to elaborate a little bit more. You mentioned foreign interference and and you you talked about security. Would you have any best practices in mind or initiative that either have been developed uh, by the European University Association or at EU level or any other examples you you would have in mind to to address that issue and how institutions or alliances themselves um, are, are able to deal with that particular topic? So right now, the topic is so important that, of course, there's initiatives a little bit everywhere. What we've seen is that different countries in the world have been addressing this. In Europe, you clearly have some that are, I wouldn't say leading, uh, because it's not about leading. It's about being prepared. Uh, and it's finding this fine line be be between uh, being naive on one side and on the uh, other side being too scared, actually. Uh, so, for example, the Netherlands has worked uh, with its government, and we're talking about universities in the Netherlands and the universities working with, with, with its government. And now they have within uh, their ministries a one-stop shop uh, where an academic can go to and say, look, I'm going to be collaborating potentially with this university and this person on this topic. Can you help me? They dispatch everything. 
they send the information to the relevant ministries that, that can then help this academic. That's one example. Another example is uh, Universities UK that has worked also with their government to identify guidelines to, to support then the, uh, you know, the, uh, with concrete document. Another country that has worked on this is Belgium, Flanders, where uh, they have uh, now developed guidelines specifically for their researcher on the, uh, uh, on the field, uh, on the bench, uh, with uh, a table uh, or, uh, if you want, a tree to follow in terms of decision making. So those are concrete examples. And then beyond that, you've got, of course, the commission now that has started tackling that. They issued last year um, guidelines on, on foreign interference, leaving a lot of room and leeway for universities to handle those. Uh, but I think that they're looking into moving forward. In the context of the uh, uh, of ERA, the European Research Area, there is currently one action, two actions actually, uh, tackling foreign interference on one side and another one global approach. Uh, we're discussing right now the new action for the next ERA policy agenda. And there I can tell you already, for having just uh, finished reading them, that there's three actions potentially we're tackling this. So you can see that this is a big emerging topic. And I think we're not the only ones working on this. There's many others. And uh, what the good news is, is that within Europe, there's quite a lot of willingness to collaborate on a topic like this, because it is important that we get it right, actually. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a fascinating topic. Um, we have a, a question on our side from, from our team, and that's addressing what you mentioned on entrepreneurship. Um, so in the context of innovation and entrepreneurship, you, you mentioned the need for collaborative aspect. Could you share concrete examples on how alliances can play a role in fostering innovation and entrepreneurship, specific entrepreneurship within the internationalization strategies? Well, again, I don't have a concrete example, and I'd love to hear actually examples coming from alliances in this case. But I think that uh, what, what we see is that the survey we did about our, uh, within our membership on innovation, we saw that there are clearly uh, innovation leaders and some who are emerging, I would say. And there's a gap between the two. And some of the gap that we identify is about uh, the staff. The staff do not have right now the skills nor the incentives actually to go into entrepreneurship or to support academics, researchers, uh, to go into uh, entrepreneurship. So that's, you know, with the education uh, uh, aspect that I mentioned, that is a clear uh, element that uh, we are going to be tackling now uh, with our expert group on innovation. We're, we're starting to tackle the skills and the competences, competences actually, uh, that are specific for innovation. So that's something you, you, you can expect, actually. But I would imagine that, you know, Alliance is very often being quite ahead. Uh, I'd be really keen to hear today or later of concrete example where, where this has uh, started to take uh, to take place. Well, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, and, and you know, Siegfried, of course, uh, jump in um, on our behalf, but we have a few projects um, going on right now. We we applying for project, at least on the side of Ulysses, that is actually addressing that topic. So the skills that are needed for the students are, in matters of entrepreneurship, uh, same for, for, for researchers, because, of course, you have researchers that are absolutely amazing at what they're doing when it comes to translating um, uh, the, the great innovation that they have into the market and this, this wall. And you, you're absolutely right. This is something we need to address. And, and, and hopefully uh, we 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 on the on, on the right track. And, and I'm hoping that soon we can share with you actually concrete examples, because this is just in the pipeline at the moment. We're working on it, but maybe we'll be the ones providing examples. But, um, yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm very curious because, for example, one of the things we stress is that today entrepreneurship is taught mostly, for example, for economics, for management. It should go beyond. If you take a very broad perspective on innovation, think about social innovation. This becomes something that, you know, even if you study uh, social sciences and humanities, it becomes something that is that is important. And when you think of the innovation we need today, to tackle climate change, for example, it cannot be just technological. It will only get us so far. We need to think about all those uh, social innovations that are needed, how to engage with citizens so that you know more of those changes can be implemented, but also ideas will, will emerge. So sorry, very happy to hear anything coming from your side soon. Thank you so much. I, I, I have to say I, I, I agree 100% and, and the, the social innovation side, that's something that we really need to spend time on. And I would tend to agree. This is amazing that we have technological innovation, but that that's probably 
it's not what's going to save us probably and that's going to help but that's not sufficient and this i think this is a topic that is incredibly important and, and one that we should really really focus on um questions from the chat we so you brought up the reform of research assessment and its global implications uh, how how alliance can contribute to this reform and what role could they play in a broader discussion on on career and research if that's okay maybe you could address very quickly what was uh, the the research assessment reform about for, for those who are not necessarily familiar with that it, very briefly wow they're not they should be so the first thing to do is to go to the coara website coara.eu and read the agreement. It's not long, it's nine pages. And really it's about the principles underlying the, the reform that's needed and followed by 10, uh, 10 rec I mean, uh, commitments. Four are really the core commitments and then there are six supporting uh, commitments. So I think that if you're not yet part as university or as an alliance, of the of Koara, do consider that because I think it's to our benefit to to us all. So that's really the, the the first step to take to get to know what it is. And then if you are already a signatory of uh, of the agreement and you're a part of Koara, then you should potentially join one of the the most relevant uh, working group. For example, EUA is leading a working group that will now look into not just research assessment but academic career assessment. So we want to go beyond actually just research innovation assessment. We want to be able to enter in there also aspects of education, uh, make sure that we don't forget innovation in the process, et cetera. And then what, where alliances can go one step beyond also is that because of your connections beyond, I mean, this morning you were talking about Africa, Vietnam, et cetera, uh, I think it is important that in this dialogue we have with uh, with partner universities outside of Europe, we don't impose, but we share what is going on in Europe when it comes to research assessment. And there, I think it is uh, spreading the good word and hopefully uh, getting this to uh, to expand also. Thank you very much. A uh, comment by John Raoul from University Côte d'Azur. Uh, we really need to empower our researcher to take up innovation and give them support and confidence to do it. I think that that's that resonates with what you've just explained, and, and I would, of course, strongly agree. Uh, by Mozart Marines, climate changes impact deeply social development. We need social innovation to mitigate the impact of climate change as well. So obviously, what, what you've uh, just explained and what you touched upon. So, um, yeah. Um, Siegfried, would you like to, to, to add something, comments or questions? Well, um, I, I think that the way we apply nowadays for doctoral networks, that the way how we set up PhD programs um, is uh, heading into this direction. There is no PhD program nowadays where entrepreneurship courses are not included, where the students are not taught how to bring their idea uh, towards towards impact or how to carry their idea on. And I remember once when we set up a, a program here in, by engaging different industry stakeholders, uh, when we shaped all the contents, at some point they said, well, we, we trust you that this is the right content to put in there, but don't forget that uh, the soft skills are the new hard skills. And I think that that, that summarizes and summarized very well what it is about. So we, we have, of course, to care about the, 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 uh, the, the, the research topics itself and, and the, the in-depth in, 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 in uh, investigation and, and the proper research. But beyond that, we have to do this extra mile and to prepare students and, and graduates to engage in societies, to bring their topic forward in order to, to provide solutions. And in this case, I just want to mention the importance indeed uh, of doctoral uh, schools, of doctoral education, uh, be it, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, reform of research assessment, for example. It's so important because they're going to be the ones that are affected the most. So they need to be able to, to, to know what's going on and contribute also to the reform and not be left out. Uh, we also more broadly, uh, you know, as you know, we have the Council for Doctoral Education at uh, EUA. We have uh, next week a thematic workshop on leadership uh, in doctoral education. And of course, those are elements that uh, we will be discussing there. Mm. Thank you very much, Stefan, for your presentation and for the for your insights and answering all those interesting questions. Um, and yeah, for the for the research assessment reform, please, if you weren't familiar with it before, please go and have a look. Um, this is really really important, and and 
Yeah. So uh, if there are no more questions or any more comments, uh, then I think we're right on time. And uh, I would like to um, maybe reintroduce or, or give the floor to Jessica Schuller and Jason Lane, uh, both part of the cross-border education research, the CBERT. Um, so Jason and Jessica, um, well, the, the, the floor is yours. First of all, hello. Hi. Um, Good morning. Our time. Well, uh, good here. afternoon or time. Well, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon or time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's such a pleasure to 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 have the both of you uh, on board. Um, um, so, just as as a reminder, um, um, you are both part of the Seabird. Um, uh, Cyber team and I, as I was saying at the very beginning of the um, of this second part, uh, your work, uh, your research work has been incredibly valuable for us. That was a gold mine when we started the Compass project and, and Ulysses. So thank you so much for that, and we are uh, well, we very happy fun. to um, very happy to have you with us this this afternoon. So the floor is yours, Natasha. Thank you so much. We're delighted to be here. And Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. All right. Let me go ahead. Natasha, can you just give me a heads up? Does that look okay? Can you see the slides? All right. Yes. Looks everything okay. perfect. Excellent. All right. Yes. So we were just saying um, uh, good morning from our end and um, thank you all for being here today. Jason and I are going to be talking about building and managing strategic alliances and international partnerships. But before we dive in, I wanted to, oops, why did that? I'm sorry. One second. Let's go back here. <laughs> um, before we dive in, I wanted to give a quick overview of the Cross-Border Education Research Team, or CBERT for short. We are a research team that was founded in 2010, and we focus on providing research and analysis, particularly on international branch campuses, but also on other topics related to cross-border higher education and transnational higher education. Um, Seabert was co-founded by Jason Lane and Kevin Kinzer, and we maintain an authoritative international branch campus list, which you will find on our website, and I will also talk about here in just a little bit. Our research team, depending on um, what we're working on, has about 10 members, and we are multilingual and multidisciplinary. We also bring with different expertise across multiple different methods, and we have extensive on-site experience at branch campuses across the globe. So that's a little bit about CBERT and what we do. And just to kind of set the scene for what Jason will be talking about later on, I wanted to provide a bit of context around transnational education and what the partnership context look like. And so I think it's important just as a reminder um, that within international higher education, we have kind of two buckets that we're talking about. International student and scholar mobility is bucket one, if you will, and then international program and provider mobility is bucket two. And so a lot of times the focus is on student and scholar mobility, but in this case of t &E, we're really talking about, and I will show a definition here, the movement of programs um, and institutions from foreign countries to where students are actually located physically. And so this can be best described as when learners are located in a country other than the one in which the awarding institution is based. So basically we're talking about when institutions are mobile and not the students. There's different types of transnational education institutions. We've identified four main types. These are, of course, the international branch campus. So when a university decides to start up a branch in another country, and I will um, talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Then there are international joint universities where the partnerships um, have at least two or more partners, and it's not necessarily a branch of an institution, but it could be, for example, in the case of one type of international joint universities, the binational one. Um, many of you may be familiar with German binational universities. That's when we're seeing also state actors get involved to found um, institutions, such as the German Jordanian University or the Turkish German University. We also know from the Chinese context um, that there are joint venture universities. These are also underneath the international joint university category. And then, of course, importantly for the EU context, we have networked universities. So this is where the e EU alliances would fit under. And the final category are regional universities, such as the Pan-African University or the South Asian University. And so I think it's important just to um, be aware that when we talk about branch campuses, we're talking about one form of transnational education institution. 
It is, of course, the most common type, though, and we define a branch campus as an entity that is owned, at least in part, by a foreign higher education provider operated in the name of that provider, and this is important, provides an entire academic program um, substantially on site, leading to a degree awarded by the foreign education provider. And so what sets our definition apart from others is that we really do focus on an international branch campus being able to provide an entire degree program so that the student could simply study at that institution without having to ever um, have contact necessarily with the home campus. We, of course, collect data on these international branch campuses, and this is our most um, recently published data. I will add, though, that we are currently updating um, the list. However, the while that you may see a little bit of fluctuation in the next iteration of the list, there is a large amount of stability, especially when we think about exporters and importers. So there are over 300 international branch campuses worldwide. We have about 40 countries that are um, the home countries or the sending countries, and about 80 who are the home uh, host countries who are receiving. Um, and there's about 60 closed campuses that we have tracked. The largest exporters and importers, like I said, they have stayed re relatively stable over the years. Um, so we're seeing here the largest exporters are US, UK, France, Russia, and Australia. And the largest importers also will where you will see some education hubs, China, UAE, Singapore, Malaysia, and Qatar. The one thing I'll just add to this too, Jessica, is India is a up and coming player in this Oops. space uh, with the, the national education policy that was approved in 2020. Uh, they... Um, began to allow branch campuses. They had been flirting with this concept for 10 years. They finally had to let it happen. Deakin University now in Australia set up a branch campus in India. Others are now moving into that space very quickly. And But also they've now allowed the IITs to set up branch campuses um, overseas. Some of the private institutions have been doing that in places like uh, Dubai and Australia. Uh, we've now seen the IITs, I think, just set up a campus in Eastern Africa, uh, for example. So I just the, the one part of fluctuation I think is important to know is India is becoming a much uh, more aggressive player in the t and &E space. Absolutely. Thank you for, for adding that. Um, on that note, just one other thing here. Uh, I think it's important to note that when we talk about branch campuses, um, that we don't confuse them with other types of foreign outposts. So um, you're seeing here up on the screen, there's other types of ways in which international partnerships um, can be developed with off-site um, locations in other countries. You might be familiar with study abroad campuses um, that operate in Europe for American students strictly for the purpose of study abroad. Um, there's independent sites. Uh, outreach locations, validation campuses, and then what we also see within the European context specifically are um, off-site research campuses in other countries. And so just, and Jason kind of talked about this too, you know, tracking t and &E globally is a bit of a challenge. There's no central data registry to look up everything that's happening within t and &E. Another complication is that um, many of the estimates include both offline or on-site t and &E and online t and &E. um, And so we can't always separate who's at the institutions and who's online. Um, but we do know that as of 2016, we had about 180,000 students who were studying at international branch campuses. And like Jason mentioned, as more and more players enter into the branch campus scene, we are going to see those numbers increase. We will also see um, a bit of movement in the next couple of years as the UK and Australia and other countries such as India really kind of pars out and um, enact their t and &E strategies, whether those are written or not, and um, develop campuses and program and provider mobility across the globe. And so, you know, tracking IBC growth is something that we are definitely very concerned with. It's not the easiest thing, but we do um, maintain a list of those branch campuses on our website in order to provide um, also, as Natasha mentioned at the beginning, a good um, research back database for people to use. So I will, um, with that context, hand on over to Jason to talk about building and managing partnerships. Thanks, Jessica, and uh, really delighted to be with you. Uh, before I get going on this, just a couple of, of comments. Um, one is to say, I, I'm just excited to be here that this conversation is happening about internationalization. I'm on an advisory board uh, for Stint, which is the Swedish uh, Foundation for Internationalization of Higher Education and Research. And you know, a couple of years ago, we did a paper called a Foresight 2030, which we were looking into the future to say why internationalization is important and what was changing. And right now, though, we are doing a paper on 
why internationalization is important. And we never thought two years ago that we'd have to have a paper on why internationalization is important. But as you all know, in some of the comments earlier, there is a, a lot of pushback happening right now, particularly as nationalism is on the rise against international cooperation, uh, particularly against non-aligned, uh, within non-aligned countries. Uh, whereas we have known historically that across the last 50 years, uh, a lot of great things happened in science diplomacy and education diplomacy, where countries that may have had uh, diplomatic relations that were not all that great, um, our scientists found a way to work together. Uh, in the space race, the U.S. and even the USSR were working together in the 1970s before um, the, the Berlin Wall fell, right? So, um, you know, I just to say it is so important this work more than ever that we're having a conversation like this and that we're, we're lifting up the opportunities to do internationalization work because as our world fractures, science, science, diplomacy and innovation and cross-border engagements are going to be critical, I think, to hold us all together. Uh, at least now you know a bit of my biases uh, in this space. But I'd also say is, you know, Jessica set us up and our definition very much focuses on at the education delivery, but branch campuses have been rising on the research and the innovation space um, also. Not all of them. And I, and I very much remember early criticisms of branch campuses being hollow vessels and you know no substance. But a lot of these have really um, spurred on some significant research, particularly in certain countries um, where they are. Hans Pohl and I have done some research, bibliometric, bibliometric research, which is in Scientometric Magazine uh, journal that, that we looked at uh, publication outputs of IBCs. And two things we found. One is some of them do nothing, uh, but some of them do a lot uh, and they do a significant amount. And so in places like Qatar uh, and even Malaysia, the branch campuses are the ma are a major contributor to the innovation ecosystem of those countries uh, overall. What we also found is that uh, branches and other forms of t &E expand the international relationships in ways different than the home campus have. And so if you take NYU in New York and you look at their uh, international partnerships with joint publications, they have a certain spectrum. And if you look at their publication in Abu Dhabi, it's a very different set of partners that are out there. And so in many ways, setting up these outreaches allow for a broadening of international engagements uh, in research as well. All right, Jessica, we'll go to the next slide. So what I wanna talk about just a little bit conceptually is, um, there we go. Uh, what we're calling the third space and to understand transnational education is that uh, these enterprises, even if they're just a research enterprise, let's say like the Galapagos Museum, which is jointly run by the University of North Carolina and the University of Galapagos, they exist in a space that is very different than their two home institutions do. And our home, uh, well, the first space we call is the home country space, right? We understand what that is. It's where the institution, your, it's the, think about your home institution, right? Where it exists, how, where it evolved from, what its history is. It's now setting up shop in a host country, right, which may have similar or different norms, cultural uh, expectations, politics, regulations. And, and the TNA program exists sort of in the middle of that. It's navigating both of those because the home country wants it to operate oftentimes the way it's always operated, just like it did at the home campus. But it has to adjust right to the local expectations, to the local culture, to local politics. And at times, uh, as we found, particularly when a branch campus is set up in a country that's very different uh, from its home campus, that is a lot of tension there. Uh, people on the ground have to learn how to navigate those spaces. They have to learn how to sort of run between the local expectations and what the home campus expectations are. Can be um, uh, as large as academic freedom related issues, right? When we think about academic freedom and what our beliefs around academic freedom are, not all countries protect academic freedom in the same way. Um, and so in those spaces can be a lot of conflict, but it could also be an operational conflict when you think about um, how you run your regulations and um, even as, as, as simple as getting a receipt for a reimbursement, some countries don't offer receipts when you do purchases, right? And you use cash transactions. Uh, and then to try to get that back home, right? It's a very different thing. It's very simple, but when you think about these international enterprises, you've got to navigate the space. So we've come to call this as a third space. Because uh, it is a it's a it's a it's a tension filled space in many ways. So the the um, the second way we thought about this when we um, uh, this is such a sad picture, Jessica. Um, pl plan with the end in mind. And so one, when you're setting up these international enterprises, right, you got to understand the operating environment you're moving into in the third space. But um, inevitably, it's likely that these partnerships will end at some point in time. 
And one of the things that we found early on with, with branch campuses is that many of the people who created them rushed to create one because they thought it was great to have. They wanted to do it. They wanted to be in a certain country, but they didn't plan for the end. Right. And, and anyone who has set up a business or sets up uh, any sort of corporate enterprise, your lawyers will advise you right, to write the contract so that you know what happens at the end of this if that happens. And in, in education, we often don't like to think about the end of something. We like to create it. We like to sustain it. And we don't think about what that ending could be. And um, it's really important to be able to set expectations up front with the partners. Right. What happens when this thing goes south or when certain people leave or maybe the finances aren't there anymore? Some projects have a life of their own, right? We have a five-year grant. Uh, we have this project. It's well-defined, right? We know that we're going to do X, Y, and Z to create a to create a report at the end of this and do, do our presentations, right, and move on. Others, a branch campus, a research enterprise, a research office overseas, even some international partnerships um, are don't have a clear ending, right, or clear set of final deliverables. And so at some point in time, things may go south. And, and as you saw on that earlier slide, you know, there have been dozens of branch campuses that ended. There have been many more research partnerships that have ended abruptly because something has shifted. The government policy has changed. And so it's really important to be thinking up front when that end comes, what will it look like? How, what will the separation agreement look like? If our students are involved, how will you teach out those students to make sure they're not left high and dry? If you have employees or researchers who are in a particular country overseas, right, and they're, maybe they're employed locally, how do we deal with them? Uh, so that there is some humanity in this process of ensuring people are protected uh, when this, this operation does go south. And then how do you protect your institution also uh, when that happens and the partnership uh, dissolves? Um, third is establishing uh, expectations up front. What, what exactly is it that you're hoping to get out of this relationship and with your partner? Um, and maybe we should have put this first and then say, talk about the ending. But, you know, being very clear about what this is, because a lot of times I think it is interesting. We might have a colleague in a foreign country and we create a new enterprise. We get some money. Um, we want to work together. But what exactly is it? Who's responsible for what? You know, particularly when you think about organizations, right? Who's establishing the expectations up front? Where, what work are we going to be doing together? Um, where is the funding coming from? And even, you know, it's interesting in terms of what your values and operational um modes of operation are going to be. We just did a, a case study of branches looking at um, the ways in which diversity, equity, and inclusion are included or not included on uh, branch campuses. And we took this topic because in the U.S. historically, this has been something that has been very important. Right now, there's a lot of, of political contest around um, DEI efforts within the U.S., and that's a whole other issue to get into. But a lot of times uh, prior to the last couple of years, you would have found most U U.S. campuses having a very public statement about their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and how that's manifested on their campus. And we thought, well, does that get manifested overseas? Is that a value, an expectation of foreign campuses to have the same DEI statement, right, when they are partnering in these overseas in environments? Uh, and it's not, right? We found um, some that had a similar statement to their home campus. Uh, I'll take LGBTQ rights, for example. Um, you know, we had one campus had a very clear statement about LGBTQ uh, rights for the for students and for faculty. And they had a campus in a country in Eastern Europe that that shared that belief. And so they had also had a statement that backed that uh, LGBTQ rights. But then they have a campus in the Middle East where we know that in some of those countries, right, that it, there's a not agreement on LGBTQ rights and you could not find it anywhere on, on their campus statement. And so in that case, right, their expectations were that their values adjusted, at least publicly, based upon where, the, where that particular partnership was. And so that sets up the fourth um, um, a piece of advice that we have here, and that's know your red lines. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the world is increasingly fractured uh, in many ways, and things can go awry when you're not clear on uh, what the politics are um, in a foreign country or the politics shift. And so a lot of times what happens is somebody will, or an enterprise, an institution, or an individual will develop a partnership overseas uh, in a country where, okay, they think they have some agreement on uh, how far, you know, wh what they're willing to do in terms of academic freedom or research freedom or the type of research topics that they want to be invested in. Once you establish that physical presence there or that, that operational presence, um, things can shift on the ground. New policies come about, new leaders come into play, 
Um, we've seen it a lot recently in the headlines about shifting geopolitical geopol um, uh, perspectives and the, I mentioned earlier the rise of nationalism. Uh, we've also seen it before the recent uh, um, uptick in nationalism that a lot of countries began to restrict academic freedom uh, in, in, in certain countries after branch campuses had set up shop. And so a lot of times we've seen in T&E that um, T&E activities where those policies have changed have often tried to adapt to that local change, right, and try to try to sort of navigate that space, maybe being being open to restricting of academic freedom a little bit more than they would have originally, um, you know, but had they originally known that was how far they were going to have to restrict academic freedom, they probably wouldn't have done it in the first place. Uh, once you build a campus and once you have employees, it's really hard to pull out uh, of those sort of enterprises. And so it's really important up front to be able to set what we call the red line, right? What are the things that you absolutely will not go beyond that you will end this partnership over that if a country restricts something so far or if the expectations shift in certain ways that you're willing to pull out, that you're willing to end the partnership or the, the international research engagement uh, and come back to the center on that. So Jessica, I think that's about it. And so um, these are just the sort of the summary. Again, operating environment, understand the third place, plan with the end in mind, establish your expectations and know your red lines. And Natasha, I think we might be right at 20 minutes. And so I will turn Perfect. it back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, uh, Jason. Um, this this is uh, incredibly interesting. And, and as I said, some some of the work you've done, we, we, we've had a look at it before. Um, but it's, it's always such a pleasure to, to, to go through it again. And some of the issues you've addressed that that reminds me some of the documents we, we went through at the very beginning. Um, <clears throat> Um, for um, is there any questions from uh, our audience? So um, I don't see anything right now, but maybe uh, Siegfried or, or Stefan, you would like to address some questions or comments to to Jessica and Jason. I don't know if Siegfried is here. Okay. Well, I can't have them right now. I well, can't see I'm them. I'm oh. still here. Oh, I don't have okay. any specific question, but I, I, it was really super interesting. So thanks a lot. I've learned a lot. Thank you so much, Siegfried. You're muted. Thank you for the for the very interesting, intriguing presentation. And as uh, Natasha said, it's, it's a goldmine, your material for for organizations, alliances like ours aiming for, for a branch. I'm also very grateful that you addressed the, the, the issue of the potential risks um, on the, the reputation of the organization, but also on, on individuals, be it students or, or faculty, in case something goes wrong or the, the, the collaboration doesn't take and last as long as, as initially expected. Um, so um, we are in this process of, of setting up uh, branches. Um, do you think that there is some country specific uh, recommendations or <laughs> continents which are different to 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 others um from from a us perspective but also from a from a european perspective yeah I, I, there's a second question i think i would ask um about alignment between your mission right and vision for these branches and what countries would make the most sense to be in um africa we know is a rapidly growing country right it's going to be the home to the largest amount of young people right in a couple of decades um a lot of innovation space but we've also not seen a lot of branch campus activity yet. the infrastructure isn't there in the same sort of way the expectations for foreign education um in africa right are not quite the same and so there's there's balancing out of what we see as the future versus where the stability might be for setting branch campus um, in the moment. Uh, looking, you know, looking for a location where that aligns with the students you want to serve with um, um, the type of research that you may want to do, you know, in these spaces, um, looking for to the extent possible, um, a stable environment. We can't always predict stability, but some are a bit more stable than others in these uh, these sorts of situations. Um, and then also, I mean, a lot of times we've seen countries more specifically, but to look at places where business and industry have already set up and have established 
themselves. And a lot of times we see education and business industry, right, collaborating around each other, particularly think about entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, and so thinking about ways that um, working together or at least in a similar country or space uh, sometimes can can provide additional opportunities. Happy to talk more about all of that. Um, there's so many more questions there, Siegfried, we could, we could dig into. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we realized that, and, and one of the questions this morning also demonstrated that the, the expectations, especially in those areas where we would like to engage, like, like Africa, like, like Latin America, um, sometimes you, you, you are in, 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 in contact with very well established institutions that reduces the risks. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you also want to go into regions with, with less developed institutions. And, and, uh, what is your experience is, uh, in in developing the capacities for for accreditation for for setting standards, in order to to build a branch to set up a branch, um, is this something that you do collaboratively, or in in such a case do you just impose your solution on a country which is not very co-creative and probably not very sustainable if you do it that right. way? Yeah, it depends on the environment. Some countries have welcomed the uh, what I call the imposing, but the different than us sort of environment, right? Dubai certainly is an example of that, Dubai International Academic City, you know, where they very much wanted foreign countries to set up their education system. They were not trying to replicate, right, what they had in the public sector. They wanted something that was different in that environment. China is a very different example. China has said, for most part, a couple of exceptions, right, when you come in, you need a partner with the Chinese university, we've got to figure out how to localize and sort of find that balance in that space. I... Um, what I would say is almost a, a, a answering a different question to you, though, Siegfried, is understanding um, control, governance, and authority and decision making, and who gets to make that, uh, and where does why? Because where we've seen most partnerships and or most branch campuses get in trouble is when the branch doesn't have um, when there's a significant amount of control by the local partner or the local government. Um, and that they can overturn the decision of the branch campus. And then the branch campus may end up being something that is different than what the home campus had wanted originally. Um, the decisions that are made may, may lead to a non-viable institution down the road. A lot of times these the partners are either government partners, so they have a certain ideological expectation uh, and involvement. And so understanding what the firewall is there is important. And the other is all that in some cases they have been financial partners. Uh, they've they've set up the money or they pay for the branch they they set up for the actual campus right and for them they're looking for a return on investment and that the the quickness in which they want that return on the investment may not always jive with the academic freedom and the quality and assurance issues that you're thinking about right you want to do this in the right way at the right amount of time it may take a little bit longer for something to become economically viable that partner doesn't like it right so they then make other decisions or it, it goes south very quickly. So I think understanding how these things are governed and who has a say over decision making, particularly over the quality assurance piece, is is really important. Um, I've always said it's important to have a some sort of local partner involved, just so that it helps ease the understanding of how to operate locally in that environment. But it's also understanding that um, a foreign education may purposely be set up to provide something that's different than was already available um, in that country for better or for worse but we think you know that being different is something that is often what's looked for thank you thank you very much uh, a quick uh, a question from from the audience by mozart marines uh, please uh, one of you spoke about the ongoing feelings against international education just now in germany the manifestations against ideas of for example re re-immigration. Could you comment more on that, please? Jessica, you want to say anything? You want me to take that? I mean, I think it's just important to contextualize that a little bit. And I think what might be interesting is also to talk about the work that you're doing there with Stint around that. And so um, doubling down on international education in times where we are seeing a lot of pushback um, might mean that we go about partnerships in a different way or that we look at different regions or areas in order to build out that capacity, but also to um, look for really the internationalization for society component and how are we bringing together internationalization projects for the betterment of our societies. Jason, did yeah, you want to add on to that? That's right. Yeah. I, I think the a lot of the pushback we've seen is around national security, 
related issues, right, and fear, um, uh, particularly as we've seen increases in immigration here in the U.S. also, uh, similar sorts of issues. And uh, the tendency, I think, has been in the current environment to put up walls, to sort of distance ourselves. Um, and I think we've got to find the, the, the balance there, right? We've got to obviously either, um, think through what the opportunities are for facilitating some of that mobility, for thinking through how do we help raise it into cultural awareness and into cultural understanding through international education. Um, and perhaps we do things a little differently than we've done in the past, but I don't think it means shutting the doors entirely, right? That's the worst thing that we can do or to end all international partnerships. There's been a lot, obviously a lot of pushback against uh, partnering with certain countries around the Ukrainian war, um, right? And I think those are very good questions that have to be asked in the space, right? And what was interesting, one of the very first things that happened when the Re Ukraine, war, Ukraine war occurred is that we saw um, sort of this, this in, almost immediate pushback against partnering with Russian scientists and Russian universities. And we can get, I mean, there's a whole sets of com complexity around that right now because education has become more of the state in certain places, perhaps, than it has um, previously. So that has changed the dynamic as well. Um, but I also think there's still opportunity for us to, to, to continue to have strong partnerships, relationships, or at least mutual understanding with each other through science uh, and through education. And the role of education is to help us to build a broader understanding um, of each other and hopefully eventually a welcoming environment. But I think we just have to acknowledge a lot of these political issues that are happening uh, that we see in the headlines are very much influencing international education right now. Thank you very much. And I think much. that, you know, I just, I would just say the pandemic probably was sort of the quintessential example of internationalization at work. Countries, scientists from all over the world came together to study COVID, to come up with um, ways to uh, right, developing vaccines and other scientific responses. And even, you know, think about social entrepreneurship that Stefan talked about, right? A lot of the ways in which we think through how do we engage socially, right, on around the pandemic, a lot of diffusion of knowledge around that, a lot of international sharing, that all came from decades of work together, right, to be able to do that on a, a history of international sharing among universities and scientists and so forth. Uh, and it's interesting now to see the sort of pushback against that a bit, but I just, we, I know many of us want to put the pandemic out of our heads, right? It was a certain time in our, our life. It's still with us, but not in the same way. But I just want to say, I mean, it was, it really was, right? Our ability to address it globally as a world is a great example of the power of internationalization and international research. Thank you very much. Um, comment again by Motel Marines. Um, we also, but also to try bring young people as much as possible. So um, 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 resonating with what you were saying um, inside these programs that they can get open for a multicultural environment. And uh, in this way, in the future, they can have a more positive impact on international education. So I'm guessing that that goes in line with what you were, um, what you were uh, just uh, there's saying. A, there's a phrase of uh, internationalization at home. Right, that's used in in our context, and I think th what Jessica and I are talking about here sort of is sort of the exporting of internationalization, right? Taking what we have in our home country and setting up a shop somewhere else, but that's not to negate the importance of internationalization at home and how we internationalize our own curriculum, right? In terms of what those opportunities are for students to study, uh, to learn about uh, others, to learn about international interests, even virtual mo mobility is a way to engage them with people overseas or in other countries that may not be exactly like them, um, where they aren't able, perhaps they aren't able to study abroad, right, in a physical way, but they can, through the, you know, wonders of virtual uh, world, partner with students in other countries on group projects. And so there are ways to do this um, in a home campus environment, and, but it's critical, absolutely critical. Thank you so much. Um, I think one question from our side, uh, would you be able to share some concrete examples of long-term par partnership of this third space? I, I love this expression, by the way. I mm. think that really encompasses exactly what this is about. Uh, would you have uh, very concrete examples of, of something, you know, um, either a campus or any form of collaboration that has lasted for a very long time, that's very strong and, and, and keeps going at the moment? Yeah, there are... Um... A few out there, you know, one that's often overlooked is Webster University. It's based in St. Louis, Missouri. They have six campuses around the world now. They started in, I believe, Geneva in the 1970s. Um, you know, and then now they're in uh, Thailand, and uh, I think they have one now in Africa. Um, their their work, right, because they have been doing this for 40 years now, essentially, um, 50, maybe almost 50. 
uh, you know, they the way they have set up shop that what they have done is they have attempted to understand the local environment, but then also understand what is core to them as an institution. All right. And so no matter where they go, these are the expectations of their core that is everywhere. And then how do we adjust that to the local environment? So operating in Geneva is going to be different than operating in Thailand or Vietnam. Right. And yet for them, they still have internal operations that allow everybody to be part of Webster University and hold, hold constant in that space. So um, Webster is one uh, that I, I might look at uh, in that space. Um, Nottingham, uh, not, University of Nottingham has been pretty successful with its campuses in Malaysia and Ningbo also. Um, the way that they have grown, the way that they have, um, or Kuala Lumpur and um, Ningbo, um, uh, you know, held core to who they are as an institution, developing education first, expanding that, adding research onto it, but, you know, um, and then a lot of flow. What is also interesting is places I think they do really well is they develop ways for students and faculty to flow between the institutions. And that's not always the case. A lot of times we've seen you set branch campus and it's an island to itself out there on its own, um, almost to be like distance from the home campus. And that, you know, th there then they will tend to sort of move more toward the, the second space in that environment because they don't have the strong connections to the first space, but the first space gets mad that they're doing that, right? And so... I, I think one of the things I would say that we've learned from this, and, and I can share a Natasha report we did with OBHE a few years back on successful branches, uh, was really this flow of people and, and sort of that people feel that they're part of an overall organization, overall system, and they're not isolated or islands out to themselves. Jessica, anything you want to add on that? I would just say I think other good examples are NYU, Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, that kind of campus system, as well as um, the RIT campus system in Croatia, Kosovo, and Dubai. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe a, a question related to, to European, uh, European University alliances, um, because that's what gathers us today. Mm -hmm. What is your... What is your perspective? What is your perception from the United States? Because um, um, Jessica, you're originally from Germany, but you've worked in the United States for many, many years. Um, how how is it perceived, or is it something that is studied at all, or, or how would you, as as the two researchers, look at uh, what what we have been doing as as European University alliances, and where we fit into this internationalization? So not just the fact that we yeah. came together within Europe, but we're also trying to go beyond Europe as well. What would be your take on that, Jessica? Just a quick correction there. I actually am U.S. American. I'm not German. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to clarify that. Um, it's a common uh, common point of confusion. Um, so in the U.S., there are certain priorities around research and education, and the EU alliances is something that fits into programs that are looking specifically at international higher education. And um, the view is really kind of pending, right? Because we're interested in understanding these different scenarios that have been proposed by different researchers, but also institutions in Europe that are tracking the alliances. Um, what are the alliance's goals going to be? Are there going to be individual goals for each alliance? Or is the EUI overall going to follow one of these strategies of Ivy League of Europe, social institution focus, et cetera. And so it's kind of this moment where we are watching to see what is going to happen, especially as multiple rounds now of funding have been secured for, for many of these alliances. I, you know, I'd add, and you know, we all wear multiple hats, so I'm going to put a different hat on um, for a moment. I'm, I'm also the president of the National Association of Higher Ed Systems in the United States. And you know, the focus there is on these multi-campus relationships. And how do we facilitate collaboration among institutions? And um, so I think from a U.S. perspective, um, the EAU sort of fits into this system's work. How do we think about the idea that we need to not just operate individual institution by individual institution? How do we think about network systems? The U.S. context, we even have that within the domestic setting. A lot of times, a lot of our states are more, we have multiple campuses that are governed by a single governing board, but they don't always get along. And so we're trying to find ways to help them collaborate. But I think, you know, we're also thinking about these networked opportunities uh, as well. I'm, I'm also with the University of Illinois system. And, you know, we have partnerships with Brazil and with Mexico and with Toronto as we think about ways that we can align around agriculture or around sustainability, um, you know, and developing sort of meaningful international partnerships. So I think you all are ahead of the curve in this space. You're leading the way. Uh, we have we a lot we can learn from you all also, but I think that that these networked uh, environments are just going to be so much 
more important higher education in the future. Thank you very much. So we're a good case, case study. That's good to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no other questions from from the audience, then I think we, we I can conclude uh, this this second the second part of our conference uh, today. Oh, actually, um, we have uh, um, comments from Mozart Marines uh, in the direction of flows. As Stefan is pointing, one of the biggest problems here in Brazil is the curriculum. They have to be more fluid, able to count for to count for credits which the student mm -hmm. took abroad. Is there anything yeah. you would like to comment on? Yeah, I'll just say this is one of the things that if I understand your context is understanding what the local environment is from a, a regulation and quality assurance um, perspective. Um, uh, Kevin Kinzer and I had done a piece for UNESCO on this a little bit about um, how do you navigate the creation of a new university, right, in, the, in, in maintaining quality assurance and regulation. And so um, this is one where there can be a lot of disagreement when you're setting up in a foreign country, particularly if that foreign country says you will do it exactly the way we've always done it. And you're going to follow our regulatory scheme, and that might be very different than at home. Uh, and so you've got to you've got to know going in how you're going to adjust to that those offerings and to understand how to accept the accept the curriculum or adjust your curriculum to meet the local regulatory needs. I don't know if that exactly answered the question, but. That's often I been... would just also add on to that, that UNESCO no. IELTSEC in um, Latin America is doing a lot of work in that space right now and looking at how can we recognize across borders, not only in, in the Latin American context, but also globally. So they're definitely an actor to watch when it comes to that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. If there's no more questions, then we will conclude there. I would like to uh, to thank uh, you, Jason, you, Jessica, Stefan, as well, for your intervention for this, this, this afternoon. I would also like to thank the speaker of this morning, Frédéric Vidal, Franz Fischler, and uh, our rector, Andrea Seltman. This, this were great, engaging conversation. We've learned a lot. So thank you so much for, for, for having presented uh, your work uh, today with us. Uh, thank you also to the participants thank you so much for 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 attending this event uh it was it was a, a true pleasure to 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 organize and, and and moderate so thank you very much um i would like to uh, announce that on april the 24th of this year we are going to have the follow-up um, of this uh, of this uh, event um, and it will be divided in two parts again so you're cordially invited to join as well the first part will be dedicated to uh, our actual cooperation with Danang and the University of Laval and the second part will be dedicated to good practices for alliances uh, or in joining alliances and in this particular uh, part we'll be jo we'll be joined by uh, four EU2 members so for those not necessarily familiar the four EU2 is a forum that was created along with the European alliances. The 4U2 is for the second generation, which is our generation. And um, this um, essentially the idea is to provide a forum to tackle different topics such as geopolitics and internationalization. That's the one we uh, we were part of. And so we will um, have them um, do uh, some, some presentation on that day. So you are already uh, invited to join the next event. So save the date. That will be April the 24th, uh, 2024. For. Um, I would like also to thank um, Siegfried uh, for, for being with us today, moderating the first uh, part of the event and, and being there with us in, in the afternoon. A big thank you goes to uh, people that you cannot see, I believe, from the platform where you are looking at the, the, the event, but that's my two colleagues, John Gardiner and Katharina Wolf, who have done an incredible work in preparing this conference. So to you both, Thank you so much for all the work you've done. Thank you to the participants. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and that's it for me. I wish you a very good um, afternoon and a very good day for our American friends. <laughs> Thank you also from our end. Thank you.